Hello everyone, welcome to the program. I'm Takashi Gojobori. Here is Professor Carlos Dode. Welcome to this program. Thank you, Takashi. Delighted to be in your lab again. So, Carlos, why are you interested in uh, seagrass? Well, seagrass are a very small group of flowering plants composed of maybe only 60 species. That means only one in every 5,000 flowering plants are seagrass. But this small group of plants have had a unique capacity, which is the capacity to colonize the sea, and they grow underwater in the shores of all oceans except Antarctica. And that unique capacity to colonize the sea has raised the interest of how they're able to cope with the many adaptations required to grow in the sea, how do they flower, how do they pollinize, how do they cope with high sanity. So looking at the genome, we thought we will find the key to understanding why these plants have been able to colonize the largest habitat on Earth. I see. So by sequencing the whole genome of seagrass, what did you find? So basically we found that eight major changes were required to achieve this important milestone in plant evolution of getting back into the ocean. One of them, of course, was the capacity to be able to remove salts so as to be able to cope with the high sanity of seawater and that they have developed a lot of transport systems to be able to remove excess salts like potassium, sodium and so on. Because there are no insects underwater, then many of the protection mechanisms that plants require in land to be able to defend themselves from insects were no longer required. And at the same time, they also dispose of genes that code for molecules that are released by plants into the air to communicate among themselves. They're called infochemicals, and underwater that communication is not so effective, so they remove them. They also dispose of stomata, which are special structures within the plants because they're fully submerged in water, so there's no transport of water along the plant. Also, they acquire the capacity to grow in sediments, like soils that are deficient in oxygen, and defend themselves from high sulfide, which is very toxic to the plants. So, eight major adaptations. So, it means that those genes are lost. Yes, but then many new capacities were required and there was a lot of functions that evolved to be able to perform those functions. One of them, for instance, is being able to resist seawater salinity. So the plants develop a whole array of genes that are involved in releasing the salts so that the plants do not develop very high loads of salts. Also, the submarine environment is different from land in that the light is very dim. So they have developed uh, new systems to be able to use that spectrum of the light and be able to cope with very low light level. Then freshwater weed can be thought as an ancestor of those seagrass? It is very likely that the seagrass evolved from a freshwater ancestor to be able to colonize the sea. Terrestrial flowering plants that we see in fields and land, they probably also evolved from a freshwater ancestor. So the evolutionary pathway will be from the development of photosynthesis in the sea, algae, and colonized rivers and lakes. Then from there colonize the land, also from rivers and lakes go back to the ocean. Oh, Could you tell us what would be the impact there's three important elements. One of them is basically understanding the adaptations required for a flowering plant to be able to grow in the sea, which is a fundamental research question. But there are two implications and important elements that we can derive from that. So if we look at the family tree of seagrass, they are very closely connected to rice. So if we understand how these plants are able to grow in full strength seawater, it is possible that we can find ways in which we can help rice to develop the capacity to grow in seawater. We will probably be some ways resolving bottlenecks for food production for humanity. Yeah, that sounds very important and very interesting. So thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you.